Ben, don't we have a show today? Oh, yeah. I'm your executive producer, Ben Schilling, and welcome into the final episode of Bracketology. Hello and welcome into our third edition of Bracketology. I'm Tommy Sandmeyer. And I'm Jake Webley. Thank you so much for joining us. The NCAA tournament has come to an end, and, so that, and with that, so does our Bracketology competition. Now, Jake, how'd you think you did? You know, for the first time making a bracket, I think I did okay. Yeah. I tried my best. Hey, I saw you in the top 20. Well, thank you. I tried my best. <laughs> we'll get to this year's champion in a moment, but first, let's start with our Zags who were unfortunately defeated in the Sweet 16 against the four-seed Arkansas. Drew Timmy finished with 25 points and, as he's done all year long, been our team's encouraging leader, while the Razorbacks were led by 21 points from J.D. Note. The Zags had an incredible season filled with countless memorable moments and added yet another WCC championship title to the trophy case. Here's Coach Few after the 74-68 loss. Uh, well, it's always, gosh, just uh, so tough, you know, when it finally ends, especially short of the goal we all had but again all the credit goes to uh, Arkansas they really their defense was was pretty uh, just tough to get any rhythm against I don't think we never really got any sort of rhythm either in the first or the uh, uh, second half and, and um, to me that was the difference in the game the Zags lost at the whole campus hard and I know that some of us myself included are having a tough time processing it GUTV reporter Ethan McReynolds went out onto Bulldog Alley to see how Gonzaga's campus is coping with the loss. I'm Ethan McReynolds here with GUTV. I'm at the center of Gonzaga's campus asking students how they're processing the Zag loss. How are you coping with the Zag's loss last week? Not well. Not in, not in a good way at all. I think the first night was really sad and depressing. Definitely a couple days. No, not, not really coming out of my room too much, man. I was mourning. Pretty angry, I would say. Like just a couple, one or two holes punched in walls, but I had to give my knuckles a rest. Some pillows that were punched, but that's about it. President McCullough, how are you uh, coping with the, the Zags game? I'm doing, I'm doing well. I'm, I mean, I am sad for, uh, you know, for our student athletes, for the players. They did a great job. They really did. All through the season, both teams, you know, and it's always hard when it comes to an end. It always is. And we always want them to go further. Not well, it, it, it seems like. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, it was. it's bittersweet. But at the end of the day, we go to an amazing school. We're going to fight to the end. And we'll be there next year. I think we'll be we'll be back next year. We'll be we'll be coming out hard, and you know I think, I think we'll make some plays next year. So don't sleep on the Zags. Thanks, Ethan. I for one am still heartbroken from the game, but I am still so proud of our guys. But Brandon, can you say the same? Yeah, it was sad to see, but it was still amazing how they were, they finished as the number one overall seed, but. I don't know if I was punching any walls after the loss, but how about you, Jake? Um, if I remember correctly, I punched two pillows and a wall. Oh, love it. <laughs> Anyways, Gonzaga students are not the only ones with strong feelings about the tournament this March. Let's head over to Zagatron and see the social media responses to all the madness from the past few weeks. Twitter had some pretty emotional reactions after the Zags game. Many people were devastated about Arkansas upsetting Gonzaga in the Sweet 16. Some even used their Twitter fingers to blame the referees for the loss. On the other hand, others were quick to point out that we actually took two losses to Arkansas that week, with five-star recruit Anthony Black committing to Arkansas instead of Gonzaga. But I think my guy Scuba Steve sums it up pretty well, explaining that Gonzaga is going to be just fine next year. 
Let's move on to the Women's National Championship. The Grammys were airing at the same time as a championship game, but that did not stop devoted sports fans like Nick here from watching the final showdown. The South Carolina Gamecocks defeated the Yukon Huskies to secure their second national championship in school history, and Twitter was absolutely loving South Carolina's head coach, Don Staley. From journalists to WNBA legends, people were obsessed with Coach Staley's energy and leadership. Transitioning to the men's national championship, the Kansas Jayhawks defeated the North Carolina Tar Heels by only three points, and Twitter was freaking out about the comeback. The Jayhawks completed the largest halftime comeback in the history of the men's national championship. Even the college basketball legend Dick Vitale had to give the Jayhawks a shout out for their historic victory. I think a lot of us on Twitter were split on whether we wanted the Cinderella story or the one seated favorite to take home the trophy. However, one thing many of us agreed upon was our infatuation and excitement for the one shining moment video. That's all I have for social media updates. Let's now send it back to Jake. The end to the bracket season is always bittersweet. Though there will not be any college basketball until next season, we can now crown our champions of this year's bracketology. GUTV analyst Isabella Harris-Hamlin has more in Opila. Isabella? Thanks guys. Well, with Kansas taking the win in the NCAA tournament this past Monday, more than a few brackets took a turn for the worst, but some for the best. Here are the final results of GUTV's bracketology. Women came in for the win in the overall rankings this year with Annie Penwell scoring first place with a whopping 232 points. Annie had faith in North Carolina when no one else did, picking them to reach the Elite Eight in her first place bracket. And here's a throwback to your first bracketology win and congrats on your second, Annie. Right behind her was Kathy Mashu in second place and Gina McReynolds with 223 points. Killer job, ladies. In our friends and family category, Kathy Mashu and Gina McReynolds made another appearance on the leaderboard. Kathy came away with the gold, having Villanova and Kansas in her final four, while Gina takes silver, having picked 26 out of the 32 first round games correctly. Our students category was led by a star news anchor and basketball guru, Tommy Sandmeyer. Tommy crushed the South bracket, predicting 11 out of the 15 games correctly. Lucas Miranda followed closely behind Tommy, and just barely making it to third place is our very own executive producer, Ben Schilling. Who knew he had it in him? Finally, Annie Penwell takes another first place dub in our alumni category, and Reed Vito takes second. And a round of applause for Reed, who was the only one on the leaderboard to call Kansas as the winner of the championship game. That's a wrap for this year's Bracketology. Great job to all who participated, and we'll see you next year. Thanks, Isabella. How'd your bracket do? You know, this year was the first bracket I've ever made, and I didn't do too well, but I did do better than our bracket breakdown host, Ethan McReynolds, so <laughs> I'm stoked for that. Well, I guess we all can't be champion like Tommy Sandmeyer. Come on. <laughs> We are stepping aside here, but don't go far. When we come back, we'll hear from our hoop experts as they take a look at the Zags' performance in the tournament. Then later, we'll hear from our alumni of the week and see how Gonzaga impacted their new position. Litter Captain, the world needs you. You know what to do. I'm on it. You there! Not the litter, Captain! Don't litter, or I'll be bitter. Welcome back to GUTV Bracketology. I'm Tommy Sandmeyer. And I'm Jake Webley. Glad to have you with us. 
Alumni are a constant reminder to GUTV students of what they can accomplish once they leave the studio. And this week's alumni sets the bar high by still contributing his time to our program. Ariel Claiborne has more with our Alumni of the Week. Ariel? Thank you, Jake. This week, we take the time to once again highlight one of our special and talented Alumni of the Week. In our final edition of Bracketology, we have saved one of the best for last, and things have certainly come full circle for Stephen Carr. Once a standout at GUTV, Stephen Carr is now working at Gonzaga in the athletic department as the video broadcast and production coordinator. His interest in the world of broadcasting was sparked at an early age. This is cheesy and corny, but I know I'm not the only kid who did this, but I would like announce me and my brothers like video games. Like if we're playing Madden, I'd be like announcing the games. And so that's what I wanted to do. I want to be either an on-air talent, sports center anchor, play-by-play. -play. Um, and then I got to Gonzaga and I f like fell in love with the production behind the scenes side of it like almost immediately. Now overseeing all the live streams for Gonzaga Athletics, Steven received his first taste of live sports production nearly a decade ago. They recommended me to SWX and like, hey, this kid might be able to just direct a baseball game if you need him to direct a baseball game. And so um, that's what I did at the end of my sophomore year. They had a Gonzaga baseball broadcast. So they asked me to do it praying that it would work, uh, and it did. And I started directing more and more baseball games for them. Um, I started doing football games, and so I was directing actual sporting events my sophomore, junior, senior year in, in, in college. GUTV brought inspiration and passion into Steven's life that he hopes he can continue to see in current and future students. One of the things that not many people knows, um, in 2016, the year after I graduated, I actually helped Dan Garrity teach the 203 class as just an alumni volunteer and that was one of the most fun things that I've done is actually t basically help teach a college class and watch freshmen and sophomores just find a, kind of like find that button in their head that just kind of clicks on at some point in time and like seeing that moment um, is pretty cool. It's kind of those, those aha moments um, that you never kind of get tired of. It is truly inspiring to see all that Steven has accomplished so far in his career and the significance he still holds within the Gonzaga community. Now let's send it back to the desk with Jake and Tommy. Thanks again to Steven for being such a great guest this series of Bracketology and for all the work he does with broadcast students as athletics production coordinator. Now with thoughts on the Zag season, we have Ethan McReynolds in the McCarthy Athletic Center joined by some guests that you might recognize. Take it away, Ethan. Thanks, guys. Welcome back in a Bracket Breakdown. It is a special episode. We are here in the McCarthy Athletic Center. I'm here, as always, with our special guests, Stephen Carr, Nathan Gustafson. Guys, thanks for joining me today. Um, unfortunately, we're not here on the, the happiest of tones. Uh, Gonzaga lost a Sweet 16 game to Arkansas uh, by a score of 74-68. Uh, what went wrong? They missed shots. And that's, that's kind of, sometimes that's the worst way to end your season because you like to, when a season ends, uh, at least for me, you like to feel like you got beat. Like last year when they lost to Baylor, they got beat. And even in 2019 when they lost to Texas Tech, that, that Texas Tech team made everything really, really difficult on them. I'm not, I, I don't think Arkansas made that many things difficult for them. I think they just missed a lot of open shots that they've hit pretty much throughout the season. Like Andrew Nemhard missed a lot of seven and eight foot floaters that he's made throughout the season. They had a bunch of transition threes that they've hit throughout the season. They just didn't. Um, so it's just, it's an unfortunate way to go out. There's a, um, a Twitter account called Shot Quality, and it tracks shot quality, obviously. And uh, it said based on the quality of shots that Arkansas got and the shot, uh, quality of shots that Gonzaga got, Gonzaga wins that game 83% of the time. And it's just, it's a one-off, and it happened, and it's just a, a, an unfortunate way to end the season. Well, I think even more frustrating seeing Arkansas get steamrolled by Duke, knowing that we probably could have competed a little bit better than them. Uh, Nate, what did you see? Yeah, I mean, it was a really, really tough showing from our guards. I think Nemhard struggled a lot, Strother struggled a lot, and I think, you know, probably the most defining stat I can get from that game is that Drew Timmy and Chet Holmgren, uh, who, you know, your star players are going to take more difficult shots over the course of a game, those two combined for 14 of 28 from the field. The rest of the team was 10 for 36. And of that 10 for 36, a lot of those were really open looks that were generated from the three-point line and we just couldn't hit. I would say that was the biggest reason we lost. Uh, you know, almost always a bad look to blame officials following a loss. That's not what I want to do here. But at the end of the day, I think we got to look at our own team. Our guard play was 
not very good. We missed a lot of really open shots. Andrew Nemhard, who was just an absolute star all year, I think that, you know, going into that game, you could have made the argument that he was a top five point guard in the country. And, you know, he just struggled and it was, you know, a tough showing for our team all around. With the Sweet 16 loss, you know, very unexpected. Uh, Nate, would you call this season a success? I wouldn't, but I think it's a testament to how far our program's gone. And I think that when Sweet 16 exits are a disappointment for your season, that shows you know, just how elite of a program Mark Few has built here. I think that, uh, you know, I look at the talent on our roster, the fact that we were a number one overall seed, and the hopes were so high, you know, going into the tournament, and rightfully so. I think there was a lot of talent in that locker room, a lot of potential. And that's the thing about March Madness, and that's what makes it so special, is that basketball, any team can get hot at any time, any team can go cold at any time, and it's a one-game elimination tournament. It's not like the NBA where you can screw up three times and still win a seven-game series. It's just not how it works, and that's what makes every game so meaningful and so special. Uh, so I wouldn't hold it against our guys too much going out in the Sweet 16, but I do think overall, uh, you know, looking at the talent that we had, I do think only making it to the Sweet 16 is a bit of a disappointment. Uh, that's going to do it for this segment of Bracket Breakdown. We'll be back later in the show. Coming up on Bracketology, we're going to highlight our Senior of the Week, and there's another program at Gonzaga that is nationally ranked in this year's Top 25. We're going to highlight that after the break. Those longboarders are really starting to get on my nerves. Bikers and scooters too. They act like they own the sidewalk. Yeah, earlier I was walking around and I saw a skateboarder. He was coming at me real hot and my friend was like, whoa. Then he just ran right into me. Then I looked at him and he said, uh, <laughs> my friend told him to share the concrete. So then I was like, yeah, share the concrete, bro. Yeah, people with wheels need to share. Chances are you've walked right on past it, but the Next Gen Tech Bar is the new spot for your tech needs. Their new support center is by students for students. Don't be intimidated by their white lab coats because they are more than happy to help. Whether you need a password reset, software update, or a new Ethernet cable for your computer, the NGTV staff has got you covered. So come on by and get the help you need today. Welcome back to GUTV, this is Bracketology. Now Tommy, do you know who the Senior of the Week is? I do not, and I have asked almost everyone. I, I don't know who it is. I don't know who it is either, but I think I know someone who does. GUTV reporter Sophie Otto spent some time with our Senior of the Week, and Sophie, who's this mysterious senior? The moment you've all been waiting for, our Senior of the Week is Ben Schilling. He has been an inspiration to many of us in the department, and having seen his journey since freshman year, it's clear his future will be bright. Ben Schilling is not your typical Gonzaga student, but rather an extremely skilled broadcasting senior. You can always find him in the broadcast building, checking out camera equipment, or helping those around him achieve success. Uh, when I came to Gonzaga, I was an English major. No real reason why, just writing essays in high school was pretty easy for me, and it just felt like something I could keep doing. After taking a studies in fiction class, which is my first upper division English class, I realized it wasn't very fun and that maybe I didn't want to do that the rest of my life. And so, as a result, I took fundamentals of TV production with Professor Fitzsimmons and enjoyed it. So I said, what the hell, switch the major. I don't really know what I'm best at when it comes to broadcast. I think I know a little bit about a lot of things. and. I might not be the best cameraman, I might not be our best editor, and I'm definitely not our best on-air talent. Um, but I think I can do a pretty good job in almost every one of those fields, and so it's really hard to f catch me in a spot where I'm uncomfortable or I don't know what I'm doing. While Ben may come across as humble, Carter Culver, among many of his peers, find him to be an extremely talented student and great friend. Living with him my junior year here in Kennedy was a time, to say the least, uh, that, that man is always chipping away, working on his next big project, and he's definitely a character. It was certainly different than having just class with him, living with him, and loved him as a roommate. He's really great at being calm and collected under pressure. You see that all the time throughout directing roles, producing roles, and um, I think that's just evident in his everyday work. In addition to being a mentor to close friends, Ben has also left his impact on the community. I think I'm most proud of how far I've come. 
the fact that I know where I went, where I started, and where I've been, and now where I am, I think it's really encouraging going forward in life. It is clear Ben's future will be one of success. I know many Zags will miss his friendly face in this department. Thank you, Ben, for helping us check out our equipment and always being a friendly face. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Sophie. The broadcast department has many more senior students that haven't been featured, so a huge thank you to all of them as well for their great work. Though the basketball season has come to an end, there are still other Zag sports garnering national attention. Gonzaga baseball is off to a red-hot start this season, currently sitting at the top of the WCC standing with a 19-7 record. The Zags have made a home out of wherever their travels have taken them, posting a 13-3 record on the road, including sweeps at both Cal State Fullerton and Oklahoma State. Now the number 15 team in the nation, the Gonzaga baseball team, has the potential to take a trip to Omaha this spring. All fall, all spring, our coaches have pre preached, you know, our end goal is to make it to Omaha. We want to make it to Omaha, win a regional, win a super regional. And we had a really good start to the season. Uh, third weekend, end up going into Oklahoma State, who was ranked fifth at the time, and sweeping them in a series at their place. And I think kind of the defining moment was after that third game, we're walking out the bus and there's kind of this moment where like I'm looking around and you know, if we can go into a top five opponent and sweep them at their field, where can't we win? You know, who can't we beat? Why not? Why not us? We are going to take one last break, but stay tuned for the second part of our bracket breakdown. Stick around. Hello and welcome back to Bracketology, I'm Tommy Sandmeyer. Let's send it back to our experts in the McCarthy Athletic Center to learn more about what's to come for the Zags. Welcome back into Bracket Breakdown. We are back here in the McCarthy Athletic Center. I'm here, as always, Stephen Carr, Nathan Gustafson. Uh, sort of looking ahead in this segment, uh, starting with the women's Gonzaga basketball team, um, they're, they're, they're facing some losses. They have some key seniors from this season. Uh, Stephen, who are they losing? Uh, well, they're, they're th I guess, the four biggest seniors. Uh, Melody Kempton, who had an unbelievable senior season. Um, she was kind of a, a huge role player for them their first three years uh, on campus. And then this season, she took a step into the starting lineup and was just phenomenal. Um, and the thing about her is how efficient she was. And I think she, I believe, I don't know if this changed after the last game of the season, but she entered the last game as the career leading field goal percentage leader in the history of Gonzaga. Like, that's how efficient she was. So losing that is obviously going to be huge. Um, and then two perimeter players, Sierra Walker, Abby O'Connor, were both fantastic this year, super seniors. Abby O'Connor was a fantastic defender. Sierra Walker was just a dead-eye sharpshooter, finished top 15 in the country in three-point percentage. Um, and then the surprise for me this season, I think, was Anna Verjogi. She took an enormous leap from her junior to her senior season, um, provided some, some rim protection, was a lot more efficient at the rim. So um, losing all four of those is, is going to be tough to replace. But Lisa Fortier has a ton of depth on her team. She always plays a lot of players, which bodes well for next season. Um, new players just stepping into to bigger roles. And Nate, who are those players that are going to need to step up next year to make it back to a WCC championship? Well, I don't know about step up, but I think the Tronk Twins are just going to have to continue the path that they're currently on. Both improved a ton going into this season, uh, stepped up as leaders on the team, and next year is going to be their senior year. It's pretty much going to be their team, and they're going to be asked to, to do a lot, and I think that they're going to be up to the challenge. Uh, the men are also losing some significant pieces. Chep Holmgren going to be a, a consensus top three pick. Uh, you got Andrew Nebhard, Razier Bolton, uh, most likely gone. Um, I think the question would be, do you guys think Drew Timmy sticks around or do you think he tests the waters in the professional realm? Well, I think that 
Drew Timmy right now is so marketable in Spokane as a superstar on the Gonzaga basketball team. I don't know that with the new NIL rules that it would be smart for him to leave because he can make so much money off of his brand that he's built here. I, if I'm Timmy, I got to look at, you know, at the chance to compete for another national championship to not leave a stone unturned to try to try to bring a championship home to Spokane and I would deeply consider staying if I were him. Um, I, I truly do think it's, it's a 50-50 thing. There's pros and cons um, to both sides. Uh, regardless, I think if he stays or if he leaves, I, th I think they're going to be looking for um, any kind of athletic shot blocking physical big in the transfer portal. Um, and then I, I think the backcourt is going to be talented, maybe a little bit inexperienced, but very, very talented. Um, so they might be looking for maybe an experienced point guard uh, in the portal as well. Um, but the, the thing about Timmy is the, the kid can score, right? And that translates no matter what level of basketball you're playing in, the kid can score. And I think he would be a second round pick this year. A, because what I just said, he's, I mean, he's a talented basketball player, but B, the, the NBA draft is a little bit weaker, especially in the second round. Um, and the thing that I look at is like, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to the NBA this year, but Jock Landale, former St. Mary's player, gets like rotation minutes for the Spurs. And I've watched Jock Landale, and if Jock Landale can get rotation minutes in an NBA roster, I guarantee Drew Timmy can work his way that, yeah. there as well. So um, I, I think Drew Timmy is going to play professionally, whether it's this year or whether he leaves after next year. That's totally up to him. I'd like to get both your takes on this next one. Um, where I mean, like, looking forward to where we're projecting the Zags finishing next year. I mean, I mean, we can talk preseason polls, but this team right now constructed Anton, Julian Strother, uh, Dominic Harris coming back from injury. What, what's he going to be like? Uh, Hunter Salas, Nolan Hickman, sort of that core of players. We really don't have that, imp that impact guy, Jalen Suggs or Chet Holmgren. Where is this team looking at? ranking next year where are they going to be in the tournament well i don't know exactly where we're going to be going into that the tournament because it's so far down the road and we're going to be looking uh for an elite level of production from really young guards who are sort of inexperienced right i mean hickman and salas were both rotation pieces for us this year who came off the bench and would come in and do a job but those two are going to be expected to uh, shoulder a lot more of the load next year. But remember, those are two McDonald's All-Americans who were two of the highest rated recruits in our school's history, and they were rotation pieces this year. So if they take the strides uh, that I believe they're capable of making and Timmy were to come back, I think that that's the storm in which we're once again national title contenders next year. And I'll just say this, that after 2019 going into the 2020 season, they basically lost like their whole roster and there were so many question marks. I mean, obviously COVID hit at the end, but they were going to be a number one seed. Nobody really expected that. And then after last year coming into this year, there were a ton of question marks. You know, who's going to be shooting? Do they have depth? Are these young kids going to produce? And they're the number one overall seed. So it's like every year, it seems like when there's roster turnover, there are questions and the team continues to produce at an elite level. And I have no doubt that they're going to continue to do that. I think the, the most nearest thing of excitement for Zag fans is going to be the NBA draft, seeing where Chet Holmgren is going to land. Um, would you guys select Chet Homer with the number of all, overall pick, given Jabari Smith, Paulo Banchero being right there at the top as well? I am going to take the cop out and say it depends on who's drafting. <laughs> but I will say this about Chet. Um, he may not be as explosive offensively as either Jabari or, or Paulo, um, but he, he impacts the game when he's on the court probably more than either of those two. Um, I saw this the other day. Gonzaga played 16, I believe. 16 games against NCAA tournament teams from the start of the year, obviously through the NCAA tournament. Um, and Gonzaga, when Chet Holmgren was on the floor, was plus 126. And when he was off the court, they're minus three. That's insane. That's how much he impacts the game. Like him on the court impacts the game in so many different ways. And that's going to translate to the next level as well. Yeah, I completely agree. The player comp, and I've, I've seen a lot of them for Chet, but I, I think he's just a completely upgraded version of Kristaps Porzingis. That height and athleticism and shooting ability mixed with elite defensive instincts, uh, the ability to be a good teammate and play off the ball, he's not afraid of contact. A lot of people make a really big deal about how skinny he is, and I watch him play, and I, it's a strong kid. He's very much, you know, a, has the ability to go inside, finish through contact. Uh, and I absolutely would consider taking Chet with the number one overall pick. The other reason I like him as opposed to the other two, and I've said this before, is his ability to fit into a system. Chet plays really, really well off the ball. He doesn't need the ball in his hands to impact the game. He's a very selfless player, and I definitely would consider taking Chet number one overall. 
I think Jabari Smith is something special, though. And I, I watch him play, and it's it's almost like you're seeing KD at Texas a little bit. And I I think this is a really, really strong draft class at the top. Yeah, I agree. The the draft class this year is insane. It's going to be very interesting to to see how that plays out. Steve and Nate, thank you so much for joining me this whole Bracketology series. Uh, it's been awesome to have you guys on. Uh, this has been Bracket Breakdown. We're going to send it back to the desk with Tommy and Jake. Some great insight from Steven and Nathan. Thank you guys so much for joining us throughout the bracket season. From all of us here at GUTV, I'm Tommy Sandmeyer. And I'm Jake Webley. Thank you for watching.